Hi, welcome to Living Hope. You know, here we really love Jesus. We love to worship and, and pray for one another. And we really love the Word of God. Now, all that is about to start, so we're glad that you're with us. Well, good morning, church. Last time I was supposed to be up here, God was speaking to my wife and not to me, so. But we've remedied that problem. Uh, so this time I get to share a word with you. And uh, I, I just want to say also how much of a privilege it is to, to be a part, not only of, of this church and to be able to share words with you and to pray with you, but I've been welcomed into many of your homes uh, for a meal and uh, in times of grief and in times of joy when we can celebrate together. And I just, I'm really honored by that. And so I just want to say thank you for that. On a less serious note, I have two jokes this morning because the first one is short. <laughs> Why did Adele cross the road? Well, how else could she sing from the other side? <laughs> I know, it's a bit of a groaner. Okay, here's the other one. Two little brothers were known troublemakers, stealing everything they could get their hands on, even from the church. One day, a pastor stopped one of the boys and wanted to encourage him, and he said, where's God? The little boy just froze in his steps. He didn't know what to say or do. And so the pastor again says, where's God? And the boy is even more freaked out. Third time, the pastor says, where's God? And the boy ran out of the church building all the way home, and he hid in his bedroom until his brother finally found him, the other partner in crime. And eventually his brother found him and said, what's wrong? The crying boy replied, we're really in trouble now. God's gone and they think we took him. <laughs> Doesn't sound like anybody I know, thankfully. Okay, I got a message to preach. Let's, let's talk about that. Have you ever had a terrible day where nothing good or even, even close to good seems to be happening, where everything that could go wrong is, and Murphy just seems to just hate you that day? Of course, we've, we've all had days like that, right? I remember a book when I was a kid called Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. As you can imagine, the book chronicles a little boy named Alexander and all the terrible, horrible, no good things that happened to him throughout that day. Things like his brothers getting toys in the cereal boxes, but him getting nothing. Things like when he woke up in the morning, there was gum in his hair, and, uh, and he wasn't very pleased about that. A couple years ago, actually, Disney made a movie about this, starring Steve Carell and Jennifer Garner, and it's actually, it's a pretty funny show if you, if you haven't seen it yet. It's a pretty clean show. And um, part of what makes the, good, the movie really good is that we can all identify, because we've all had days like that. We've all just had bad, bad days where we just, sometimes at 9 o'clock in the morning, you want to go to bed and wake up the next day. <laughs> we've all had days like that. Life tends to snowball on us on days like that, where Bad things get worse and worse and worse, and by the end of the day, you have this insurmountable problem, all these problems compiling together to make a really big problem. Maybe you find that you have no redeeming qualities at all in the situation that you're in, or you really can't find any hope or any faith to, to encourage yourself in. And I want, to, I want to encourage you in that, that there is light at the end of the tunnel, and uh, we're going to talk about that. Often I meet people in my office or, or on the street or in home group that, that they have nothing but bad things happening to them. They can't seem to find any silver lining to the situation. Whether they've lost friends, siblings, parents, or even children, Maybe they've been in an accident or just been diagnosed with an incurable and painful disease. I know that some of you here today are without work and 
waiting for family to finally arrive from another country. Maybe you're suffering with a sickness or a disease this morning, or maybe you're grieving the loss of someone close to you. Maybe instead your life is actually going exactly according to plan, that everything is going really good, and that you can't find anything to complain about. And if that's you this morning, I, I'm really happy and I rejoice with you. And I'm not, not preaching ill on you, but chances are good at some point in your life, there will come a time when something comes against you and you need to encourage yourself. I hope and pray that you may forever be void of bad days. I hope that none of us ever, ever again in our lives has one of those days. But if we do, I hope to be able to equip you this morning. My aim is to help to alleviate the burden on you that you might be having right now and to also provide you with the information that you need to know to lessen the frequency and the power of those devastating moments when they do hit. I expect to do this by preaching on just one biblical principle. But before we get into that, let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for all that is going on in Cambodia, for all that is going on in Canada, for all that is going on with you throughout this world. And Lord, we ask that you would be with us this morning. We ask, Lord, that you would encourage us, that you would challenge us, that you would bless us with your word. Lord, would you, would you use the meditations of my heart and the words of my lips and that they would be pleasing unto you, Lord God. Amen. The biblical principle I want to preach about this morning should not be new to any of you. Maybe the language of it or what I'm going to call it might be new, but the principle I'm sure you understand already. Whether you were born on a Sunday morning praising Jesus or whether this is your first time in a church building hearing a sermon, I'm sure you're familiar with this principle. What I want to preach about this morning is sowing and reaping. Because this is a, a principle that God has put in place, the world has recognized it and calls it other things as well. See, there's uh, also the principle of um, the law of cause and effect. By choosing something, we are also choosing the consequences of that choice. By choosing uh, Buddhists and Hindus, they call it karma. You're probably familiar with that, that term. Some people remove any higher power from the equation and just call it fate. One of Newton's three laws of motion, actually, is, is similar to this. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. But, you see, I'm not, I'm not Buddhist, I'm not Hindu, I'm a Christian, so I call it sowing and reaping. <laughs> and it's actually, there is a significant difference and I'll talk about that later. But the working definition of this principle that I'm going to use this morning is sow good seeds and you'll never reap any weeds. Sow good seeds and you'll never reap any weeds. Fortunately, we're a farming community. So most of, the, most of us understand that phrase just as is. And as far as actual farming goes, that is. But in the letter to Galatians, Paul writes that it actually encompass, encompasses so much more than just that. It's much more than just seeds and dirt. We can find that everywhere. So let's turn to Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 10. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It says, Don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. Let's not get rid of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Therefore, Whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good 
to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. So here, Paul explains to us that not only does the principle of sowing and reaping work with farming, but with eternity. He goes even so far as to say if we are trying to escape the consequences of our actions, that we would be mocking God's justice and therefore mocking God. If we live life for ourselves, which is, as he says, to gratify our sinful nature or to do whatever we feel like doing, we will only experience decay and death. But if instead we live to please the prompting of the Holy Spirit, we will experience eternal life. This text and teaching on this principle are used a lot, actually, in, in conjunction with, with finances and with tithing. And it's, I'm not disagreeing with those that teach that at all, but I, I believe it's so much more than that. It's so much more than just finances. So let's break this principle down a little bit and into some manageable bites here. First, why don't we start with our working definition of sowing and reaping. Sow good seeds and you'll never reap any weeds. We reap in kind of what we sow. It says that early also in our text that you will always harvest what you plant. Those who plant apple seeds should expect to harvest apples. Those who sow jealousy should expect to receive what jealousy naturally produces, like distrust, lack of intimacy, lack of openness, etc. Living a life of carnality and sin, should, you shouldn't be able to ex inherit heaven. You see, that's the same as planting poison ivy and expecting roses to come up. We can't, we can't expect that. That's not natural. That's not the way God said it to be. No one in their right mind would expect roses once they've planted poison ivy. Reaping in kind of what we sow is the norm. Now, yes, you can read in Scripture where God has transcended that principle and God has blessed those who haven't sown into it, or instead he's punished those that have sown in and they've, he's taken the harvest from them. That's up to him. That's not up to us. But the norm is that we will get more of the same. You plant wheat, you should reap wheat. You plant mustard seeds, you won't get redwoods. Secondly, within the principle of sowing and reaping is the law of multitudes. It's a law of multiplication. Every kernel of wheat that is sown will germinate, will produce a head of wheat that contains multiple seeds, more than one. The Bible talks about having ratios of 1 to 30, 1 to 60, and even 1 to 100. I was reading, doing some, inter, some research, and there are some redwoods that they're, they can't even, they're not even sure the number of seeds in a redwood tree sometimes, because each year, a healthy redwood will produce 1,500 cones. In each cone, there can be up to like 30 seeds. These redwoods are hundreds of years old. How many seeds are there? They're not even sure how many seeds one redwood tree could carry. <coughs> one little lie can produce an out-of-control frenzy of falsehoods, fallacies, and fictions. The Bible says in Hosea 8, verse 7, sow the wind and reap the whirlwind. Positively, though, one kind deed can result in a blessing that you will see for the rest of your life. One kind deed. Thirdly, it takes time. It takes time to reap what we've sown. This is one of our biggest weaknesses, one of mine, anyways, is a lack of patience. If I, if I get to doing something, I, I expect I should see the results of that immediately. And 
just need to remind myself, it takes time. Once I've sown into it, it takes time for me to reap the harvest. Many times when we change lifestyles drastically, there's still a follow through of your previously made choices you're gonna reap the, the repercussions of, yet still. So we, we can't just escape from them. Some actions, thoughts, and words will be reaped even years after we, they were sown into. So what do you do when these negative things come back to you? What, what do you do? What can you do? We can't ignore them. They're not going to go away. We have to deal with them. We have to get rid of them. But the temptation is to get angry, get upset, and to, to be derailed from where God has taken us in the moment that we're in right now. When those things from our past creep into our life, the temptation is to get frustrated with God about what's happening now and to just quit. I want to encourage you, don't let the harvest of the weeds that you are currently experiencing become the new seed that you are spreading. I'm going to say that again. Don't let the harvest of weeds you are currently experiencing become the new seed that you are spreading. Gather them up from the good crop and destroy them. I'll talk more about that later. So sowing and reaping implies a wait. Nothing good grows overnight, and the farmer must be patient in the summer, must be patient for his crop to be ready. The Bible likens ministry to planting, watering, and reaping in 1 Corinthians. That suggests a length of time. It takes time for a crop to grow. It takes time for us to grow as well. God will bring forth fruit to his glory in his time. His time, not ours. Until then, we faithfully labor in his field. That's in Matthew. Knowing that at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Again, that's Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 that we already read. Every person that we spend time with will either be sowing into our lives or watering the seeds that are already there or helping us with the harvest. So every person that you're in contact with is investing in you. And that's why I'm, I'm careful to spend time with people that I know are watering good seeds in my life. I, I don't spend much time with people that that refuse to acknowledge that they're watering bad seeds in my life, that they're sowing, sowing bad things into my life. Now, I'm all for evangelism, and that's absolutely crucial, but we also need to be, we need to be growing. We need to be careful about the people that we spend time with and make sure that they're investing in us too. So when we've sown good things, we need to wait. Wait for the right time to harvest. There's no better way to destroy a crop than to harvest it before it's ready or after it's ready. Like after it's too late, that is. So let me tell you a story about a famous baseball player. How many of you know, heard of Jose Bautista? Really? Like 10 of you? <laughs> okay, okay. So on October 14th in 2015, just a little over seven months ago, Jose Bautista of the Toronto Blue Jays was up to bat in a postseason game. Just hold on to that yet, Mike? Don't play that yet. So they were playing the Texas Rangers, and Bautista had an opportunity to take the lead and to clinch the series and to move on to the next round. So on the third pitch, Bautista crushed the pitch, and he just hammered it into left field. To celebrate the home run, he gave a long stare and a huge, huge backflip, which has, it's kind of controversial. But as a Blue Jays fan, I'm okay with it. <laughs> 
So fast forward to last week, seven months and one day later, Bautista reaped the actions of his bat flip when he got punched in the face by the second baseman, Rudnet Ordur. So the Rangers, they, they didn't appreciate his bat flip, and there was a lot of animosity between the two teams for that whole seven months until it really broke loose on Sunday. Kristen's whole family is, is huge into baseball, and so Kristen was texting her brother, and, and her brother says, you know, you can tell Odour has done that before. He knows how to hit someone, because, man, Bautista got, got smoked there. So, in this clip, remember the bat flip was from October, over seven months ago. The punch in the face was last Sunday. The bat flip at about 20 seconds into the video resulted in many, many things happening. Number one, last Sunday, Bautista was hit by, hit by a pitch to get onto base last, last week. So his last time at bat, the pitcher intentionally threw at him and hit him put him on base, which not resulted in nothing, made Bautista being mad about being hit, and so he decided to slide into Rutnet Odour at second base. It was a dirty slide. It was illegal. He shouldn't have done it, uh, but um, he did it, <laughs> which made Odour even more upset about the bat flip from October, and so he punched him in the face. Bautista get punched in the face, Line brawl ensues, multiple ejections. The next inning, the Jays pitcher, Chavez, hits the Rangers' star hitter intentionally. So Prince Fielder is walking down to first base like, what are you doing? Which resulted in another line brawl and even more ejections. So the jury is still out on whether or not Bautista's bat flip was a good seed or not. Um, regardless of that, you don't have to look very hard to see there is definitely fruit that happened from him doing that. And that one action produced multiple results. Some actions, thoughts, and words that we sow now, we won't see a return on until we even get to heaven. Some actions affect our lives even for a thousand generations. It says in Exodus chapter 20, verse 6, that God will lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love him and obey his commands. Now, I'd say that's a pretty worthwhile investment. I sure want a thousand generations from Kristen and I to be lavished with his unfailing love. That would be awesome. Or we may think that we've escaped the principle entirely. Let's talk about a habitual lawbreaker behind the wheel. See, they may avoid getting speeding tickets and seatbelt tickets and running stop signs and blowing red lights and who knows what else they might be doing. They might be avoiding those fines and repercussions of those actions for years at a time. But a portion of, of text from one of my favorite counseling books sums this up really well. He says, he may speed down the interstate at 90 miles per hour and not get a ticket, yet he has sown something into who he is, his self, his personality, his value system, his innate sense of right and wrong has been affected in a negative and self-degrading way. He has added another stitch into the part of his being that disrespects rules, that rebels against authority, that treats other people's safety with indifference, and that shows a callous hostility towards society. He may reach his destination that day in a record time, much to his de delight, but he will have done so at the expense of his soul. Most regrettably of all, he will probably have done all this without even realizing it. The sowing we do each day in small ways shows up sooner or later in several significant ways. Years may go by before the more public signs show up, but they ultimately will appear. We may be shocked when we see the final fruits of what we've sown, 
but that just reflects how naive we have been. Small seeds of moral carelessness sown along life's way turn into seeds of destruction later on. Sow good seeds and you won't reap any weeds. And don't let the harvest of your poor choices of yesterday become the seeds that you are scattering today. The only way, though, to break free of that cycle, to get rid of those bad seeds, is Jesus. He is the only way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Naturally, apple trees, apple trees produce apples, which produce apples, which produce apples, and so on. Poison ivy will flower and reproduce more poison ivy. Only God can stop this cycle of sin and death in our lives that we find ourselves in. Only Him. Jesus paved the way for us to give Him our sin. We give, it, we give Him our filthy rags. Everything that we can accomplish in this world is just <coughs> filthy rags. Worthless. We give it to Him and He gives us eternity. If you want to stop the cycle of sin and death in your life and accept Jesus' exchange, His inheritance that He gives us as fellow heirs with Him, you'll have an opportunity to do that later. All you have to do is join with us as we pray later. Jesus' exchange isn't the only thing that the cross did for us, though. We're told to be imitators of God. That means that God wants us to stop the harvest of hell on earth for other people. Sure, some people may deserve a punch in the face, but every one of us deserved eternity in hell until we took Jesus' exchange. Jesus changed all of that for us and we now can change the world for other people. <coughs> Next time someone performs an act of injustice towards you and you want to yell and scream at them, you want to get upset, you want to stand up for your rights, you want to stand up for yourself, I want to encourage you, change their harvest for them. They may have just sown some bad weeds, bad seeds, but don't let that turn into weeds for them. Change that for them. Jesus is in you. We can do that. Don't, don't react to the wrong seeds that are being sown into you from them. Change the seeds. Don't let them harvest weeds from that action. <coughs> Step out in faith. Take their seeds of anger and hate and turn them into seeds of love, forgiveness, and grace. I guarantee they'll notice and they won't soon forget the day that their harvest of hell was interrupted. It's just a cycle that they're in. You interrupt that cycle and they're going to take notice. But as I said, this needs to be done only through the strength that Jesus provides. Otherwise, we'll be expecting to see the harvest and we'll get upset if it doesn't come. In Galatians 6, 9 that I've already read, it says... Let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, see there's that time aspect again, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Only with the strength of Jesus can we change someone else's harvest for them and release that new seed of grace into their lives. If you try to change someone else's harvest on your own though, without first going to God that day or without first reacting out of what he says you should react. If you react out of your flesh and then try to fix it later, it's not going to work. We need to be going with the strength that Jesus gives us, and we can only do that if we're regularly spending time with him. So I addressed those of you earlier that are lacking in hope and faith for the situation that you're in. You're probably asking, how, you, how do you get more hope? How do I get more faith? When you take, you take that seed of faith, you take that seed of hope that you have, and you use it. You use a seed by planting it. So you plant that. Plant that hope. You plant that faith that you have. 
and nourish it. Let it grow. Let it grow. Give it time. Nourish it by being with others that are hopeful, that are faithful, and in taking care of their own hope and their faith, they'll water your seeds too. So here's what I want you to do. For those of you that don't know Jesus, I'm going to lead us all in a prayer in just about a minute. Prayer of repentance, and I want all of you that don't know Jesus to say it with us, at, say it with the rest of us. Then, all of us who have said that prayer for the first time, or whether you've said that prayer for the thousandth time, I challenge you with the verse that we just read. Don't give up. Here's how to not give up. This week, spend time with Jesus and use the strength that he provides to change the harvest for other people. When they direct their sinful seed in your direction, let Christ live through you and change their harvest for them. Don't miss an opportunity to do that for someone this week. Be deliberate about looking for those opportunities for people. Jesus changed your harvest. Now go and do likewise. As it says in Galatians 6.10, Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone. It doesn't say whenever it's convenient. Whenever we have the opportunity. If you want to accept Jesus' exchange, as we talked about just now, where you trade your eternal harvest of sin for his eternal harvest of everlasting life. I want you to pray with us. And after the service, if you've prayed that prayer for the first time, I'm going to be down here, and I, I would love to talk with you. I'll be down there for at least five minutes. So come and talk to me. If you could stand, please, though. I'm just going to lead us in the sinner's prayer. And if you want that Jesus exchange, then just repeat along with us and come and talk to me after. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I need you. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I open the door of my life and receive you as my Savior and Lord. Thank you for forgiving my sins and giving me eternal life. Take control of the throne of my life. Make me the kind of person that you want me to be. Amen. You know, a friend once told me, and I actually found it kind of surprising, that a lot of people don't understand that they're welcome at church. Uh, some people, he said, have the idea that church is like a, a club where it, you should be a member before you attend things. Well, we want you to know it's not like that, and we would love it if you could join us at Living Hope. We're on the corner of King and Kensington. We have services Sunday morning. You can check our website to, or check the newspaper for our service times. We'd love to have you come. Uh, apart from that, though, we're glad that you are with us and hope that you'll join us again.